Thank you very much, everyone. Um, you know, my greatest accomplishment was, is probably graduating from Castle High School, so. <laughs> you know, I'm so honored to be here. Um, being worthy of this recognition is, 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 uh, is a little overwhelming for me. I'm so honored to be here tonight. I'm so honored to be here alongside my fellow inductees. Um, as an athlete, uh, being, being called an Olympian, couldn't, I couldn't think of a higher honor. So I want to congratulate Clay and Clarissa on their, all their accomplishments and, and everything. It's fantastic. I, I'm so honored to be here with you tonight. <laughs> but then again, you can try to call yourself a two-time World Series champion. And that's pretty awesome, too. I'm, I'm very honored. Thanks, Shane, for all you've done and, and your success in baseball and all that you do for Hawaii sports. I'm, I'm proud to be here with you tonight. <laughs> like Liz said, uh, my journey in golf kind of started late by today's standards. Uh, I started golf at the age of 13 in the summer before my freshman year of uh, high school. I played every sport. I, I played little league baseball. I played soccer. I played basketball. And uh, for some reason, my mom took me out to the golf course this summer when I was 13. And, and I'd like to say that I fell in love with it right in the beginning, but I think it was my competitive nature trying to compete with my mom that could hit the ball in the air, and all I could do was roll it on the ground. It frustrated me so much. I needed to be out there the next day to do it again and again and again until finally Probably not till I was maybe in the tenth grade. I could I could take her on head to head and beat her, and so it was incredible. Um, I don't know how many of you remember this, but you know when I started golf back in whew, 1984, we had a deal with uh, well not a deal the the public courses and the municipal courses around the state of Hawaii would let us juniors play every weekdays except for uh, weekends and holidays for five dollars a year and it, it was really incredible they changed it midway through my high school career to five dollars a month <laughs> so um, the only problem with that was that I needed to find something to do on the weekends and so luckily uh, down the down the street from where I lived we had a driving range Bayview driving range and um, after doing my chores early in the morning I'd beg my mom to take me down there and sure enough she'd take me there and I'd I'd get through those balls pretty fast, and and uh, I, I needed to find things to do. Um, there was a repair shop just around the corner downstairs, and I used to notice all these golfers going in with their clubs, and I'd hear these saws going off and all this clatter. And I remember peeking in, and and uh, I would see this man, Vernon Silva, in the corner over there. He he was running the repair shop, and he was always in there twiddling with the clubs. And I remember I first thought to myself, well, why is this guy chopping all these clubs in half? You know, I couldn't figure out what he was doing. And uh, it soon came, I, was, I, I would peek in and shyly observe, and, and Vernon was very welcoming. He'd, he'd bring me in, and next thing I knew, I, I was there every day. You know, I was either dividing my, I was dividing my time between Poly Golf Course and Bayview Golf Course. Vernon took me in, and I'd stay there all night. I'd lie to my mom every night and said, I did my homework, Mom, no problem. I did it all. And, uh, but I'd hang out there uh, every chance I had. Uh, Vernon was really instrumental in my life. He, he gave me my first job. I would watch, I'd watch the repair shop. I would take notes and put all the repairs down, and he'd come in and do it. Slowly, he'd teach me how to, how to manufacture clubs myself, repair them, put them together. Pretty soon I was doing that. And uh, when I, he would pay me by, I would uh, take $4 per hour out of the till and I'd instantly go up, spend it on two buckets of balls and, and hit them away. Um, he also was the first one to give me my first golf clubs. Uh, it's kind of a funny story. I noticed we were at Bayview uh, driving range, so a lot of people would leave clubs there or lose them. And Fernand had this stack in the corner of clubs and when it got too big what he did was like I said he would chop them in half he'd cut those shafts off and he put the heads in a shoe box on the bottom uh, uh, underneath uh, underneath his workbench I, I, I asked him if uh, what he was gonna do with that and he goes oh those are just junk you know and so I I cautious I picked out a Spalding three iron a McGregor four iron a Walter Hagen five iron he taught me how to put the set together we put matching shafts in it matching grips on it and that was my first set of golf clubs and uh, 
I wish I did. <laughs> you know, um, also, Vernon was very instrumental. He was about my age now, 48, I think, when he had the repair shop. He had dreams of playing on the senior tour then. And uh, he worked hard on his game. He had aspirations of, of playing on the senior, senior tour. And uh, he was the first one that made me realize that you could dream big and you could think about these things and you could, you could maybe someday, it, it could be a possibility. So Vernon, I want to thank you for everything you've done for me. And, you know, when, uh, you know, back in the, back in the days, I was telling Liz earlier when uh, I played golf, we didn't have iPhones, we didn't have the internet. Um, the only access we had to golf were books and, and, you know, when they show golf on the weekends. And uh, when, it came, when it came time to, to figure out where I was going to go from high school, I, I had no idea what to do. I had no guidance whatsoever. And I remember both Vernon and my mom telling me, well, you got, you've got to go to college. You've got to get, uh, write some letters to some college uh, coaches and and they'll look at your record and hopefully they'll give you a scholarship. So what I did is I went home and I, I filled out a resume. I tried to put all my, got all my newspaper clippings, put it together, and I went off to Olamana Golf Links where they held the local uh, uh, Division One golf tournament. I handed a resume to every single coach and just waited for those phone calls and nothing came. No one came. The only phone call I got was from Bob Owan from BYU Hawaii. I didn't even know there was a campus out there. I didn't know there was a college or anything. But sure enough, he called me, he invited me to come to the campus. I went over there and it was such a beautiful campus. He said, you can, if you come over here, you can play at Turtle Bay, which sounded so luxurious to me coming from Poly Golf Course. And he says, and, and if you play well enough, you can transfer to BYU um, in, in Utah. Of course, I didn't know what that was, but uh, he, he gave me some names and he said, you know, we, there's some players that went there that, that went on to long uh, careers on the PGA Tour. Johnny Miller, uh, Rookie of the Year at that time, Keith Clearwater, Mike Reed. And so I thought that was my ticket to Division One Golf. So I signed with BYU Hawaii, which was the only offer I had. And uh, I went there. After the first year, we did we, we played well. If I think, if I remember right, Bob, we finished uh, fifth at fifth at nationals. We had two of us we were first team All Americans. I think it's the best that BYU Hawaii golf program had ever done. And they promptly canceled the program to bring in women's softball. <laughs> Title IX took over, and I was a I was a man without a home. But he helped me to get my grades up and transfer and, and did everything he could and, and he got me up to, uh, to BYU Provo and I made the team there and, and played a, a nice career there. So uh, Mr. Awan, Bob, thank you very much for especially the phone call and for everything you've done for me. Appreciate it. Um, my, uh, after graduating from college, you know, uh, you can go to, at the time, you could go to the PJ Qualifying School, and if you played well enough over the thousands of entrants, if you made the top 25, you'd get right onto the tour. So, of course, I tried that. I got some financial support from my mom here, an uncle of mine, and some other friends, and, and off I went to tour school, but I missed. So I had to find another, another thing to do, another place to play. Um, I graduated from BYU in 1992. I was actually going to graduate school when my teammate, Mike Weir, convinced me it's time for us to go and play. I talked it over with my, uh, my graduate coordinator. He said, hey, you can put your graduate program on hold, go and, go and chase your dreams, and if it doesn't work out, we'll gladly accept you back. So with that luxury and that freedom, I took off and I started my journey um, on the Australian tour. I played the Australian tour for two years. I played the Alongside with that, I played in Canada. And uh, for the first two years, I did that with, with not much success at all. Hopefully, I kept my head afloat. I was able to keep some money in the bank. And then I went over to the Asian tour. The Asian tour consists of playing in every country that you can think of in Asia. I played, from Cal I played in Calcutta, India, to Malaysia, to Korea, Taipei, and everywhere. And as my golf game got a little bit better, um, in my last year in Asia, I was in the top four or five, and with that, I was able to 
go to the Japanese qualifying tournament, and that was my first go at a, at a major tour. I made it through there, and I was fortunate enough to be able to uh, go there and be alongside my, my boyhood idol there, David Ishii. He took me under his wing. He showed me everything from how to get from course to course, tips on how to play the course, where to eat, how to travel, and everything. But the greatest example that David showed me was by his golf. As a 14-time winner on the tour, he won the money list in 1987, and I remember vividly being in college and watching him win the Sony Open in 1990. And uh, I can't thank you enough, David, for the great example that you gave to me. And all to all the kids in Hawaii, you're, you're a pioneer for golf, and we all look up to you. And thank you very much for all that you've done for me. I really appreciate it. Um, with that, I, I, had a, I had some success in Japan, and, and with that confidence, I decided again, well, every year I was doing it, I, and I finally, on my ninth try at qualifying school for the PGA Tour, I finally made it through. As a rookie on the tour, I was at the ripe old age of 32. Not quite, you know, not, not as young as Tiger Woods, but I, at least I made it there. I played 10 full years. I got to play every tournament I was eligible for. I played in every state they had a golf tournament. I played in every major and world golf championship I had. I played in London and Scotland and Japan. And at last count, uh, my girlfriend Leanne and I were trying to count it up last night. I, I counted 19 different countries I was able to play professional golf in. And so my journey was, was quite long. Um, in, in my career, I, I like I said, I, I played just about every tournament I was eligible for. I probably played about 35 events a year for nearly 20 years. When I do the math on that, that equals about 14 and a half years in a hotel room. And so by the time my, my 10th year on tour rolled around, I instead of getting excited and counting the weeks that I was going to play, I, I was really counting the weeks that I was going to be home. And uh, so at 42, I just decided I, I wanted to be at home more. I wanted to play the game of golf at a level of enjoyment rather than a level of frustration on the professional level. And so I decided to stop playing. I, uh, I probably picked up and uh, moved to the nicest place I could think of, of the ma on the map, and it was San Diego, California. So I'd been there for about five years. and. Uh, in my retirement, I know a lot of people are always coming up to me and asking me what I'm doing now, if my plans are to play the Champions Tour in two years' time. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not too sure on that. I've, I'm really enjoying my retirement. It's nice to play golf at a level that I don't really care if the ball goes in the water. I don't care if it goes in a tree. I'm just happy to be out, and I'm enjoying the walk and, and the love of the game again like I was as a little kid. And so I'm really enjoying that. But two great things happened to me when I moved to San Diego. One, um, I met a good friend, uh, I've become good friends with a man by the name of John Ashworth. I'm sure all your golfers have had his shirts in your closet and maybe still do. Uh, we became good friends and uh, as we became good friends, I, I started to, I, he was, he, he let me know that as he was growing up, he noticed that there was a couple of municipal courses that just kept going under. Two of the courses that he grew up playing just couldn't make it work, and they kind of went under. And there was a third one that was going under, and he didn't want that to happen. He grew up playing those, that course, and so he made a proposal to the city, and lo and behold, he won. And he got the rights to uh, Oceanside City Center Golf Course, which the locals at the time called Goat Hill because it was such a walk and anybody that played there just had to, had to walk up and down hills and it was very taxing. But he won the proposal, uh, got, got the course for, uh, well, hang on, I'm, I'm ahead of you, I'm ahead now. Um, and as I became good friends with him um, and he got to know my story, he knew that I grew up at Poly Golf Course, he knew I grew up at a Muni. He knew I tried my hand at being a member at a country club that didn't quite work out. I'd, I'd be at the country club and 
they wouldn't let me participate in any tournaments because if you have that pro at the end of your name, they just think you're there for the money. So I, I could be a member, but I couldn't participate in any of the activities. And so as I was telling him this, he, he kind of made a proposition to me. He asked me if I wanted to be partners with him, and I was more than happy uh, to do that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that right now that John and I are, are kind of owners of a, a municipal course. We have a 50-year uh, lease on the course, 50 years. And so that's going to take me to about age 98. <laughs> and I, I, I couldn't, thank you, I, I, I couldn't be more proud. I, I feel like, um, I feel like my golf has come full circle from someone that started off walking the holes at Poly Golf Course in Bayview to playing in 19 different countries around the world, playing on the tour, playing from everyone from Jack Nicholas to Seve Ballesteros and Tiger Woods to having a Arnold Palmer with Arnold Palmer. I mean, my uh, it, everything's great. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the, you know my next 50 years in golf, so to say. The second great thing that's happened to me in San Diego is, is, is meeting my girlfriend Leanne there. Together, uh, she's been such a... Uh, a blessing in my life and, and, and such a positive influence. Um, she keeps me on track. Uh, I like to get lazy at times now just because I don't want to work so hard. And uh, she keeps me on track and keeps me moving forward. And so Leanne, I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you also, my our little kid there, Mason, who's falling asleep. He's supposed to be listening to me, but he's sleeping. <laughs> but now we live together, and and, and it, it I couldn't I couldn't be happier with how things have worked out. Um, I'm so thankful for this honor. I, I I'm, uh, I'm I'm at a loss for words. I'm so I'm so thankful for my mom to be here. She has such a great influence in getting me started in the game of golf, to keeping me focused, to just letting me do. Uh, do what I wanted to do, play how I wanted to play, and, and was always a support. So, Mom, I, I thank you for everything you've done for me. Um, again, it's, it's just such a nice honor to be here. I'm, I'm so honored to share this night with you and my fellow inductees. I want to thank the Hall of Fame committee. Dr. Larry Price, thank you for your vision. I'm so proud to be a part of this Hall of Fame. Um, thank you again. I appreciate everyone being out here tonight.